name. Thank you, Julia, worship team, and also thank you, Jeremy, for using <clears throat> the same character I'm going to be speaking on this morning. It does not mean the message will be shorter. Okay? Um, but that was very good. I appreciate that. Yeah. In these past weeks, I've been uh, sharing a series of messages on standing up, standing bold. Just what that means, just like a lion. And uh, Jeremy did a great job explaining that this morning to the kids. And in these past weeks, I've talked to you about how courageous it is and how important it is that we would be eager to pursue and stand up when no one else would stand. Use some illustrations from the scriptures, and the Bible is just filled full. So many great truths of uh, great leaders over the years. Some of them, like David, who stood up against Goliath, and the teenage boys, the Hebrew boys, uh, that refused to drink and to eat the, the king's food and, and uh, because they didn't want to defile uh, God and, and his honor and how God blessed them. And Jochebed, the mother of Moses, who refused to and, and disobeyed the law at the time because she saw something special about this child and uh, that, that God had given to her and she refused to have uh, her son uh, killed. And then uh, last week I shared with you about Shama, the, um, just a few verses in the Bible that even mentioned this guy that was just so powerful. And he took a stand. He was known as one of uh, David's mighty men, his elite force of, um, of soldiers, who defended his little pea patch, his little, his little bean patch. And, um, and, and he beat the Philistines when no one else would stand with him. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those times in your life and my life when uh, we're standing on the biblical truths that God gives to us. This week I've seen some of you uh, do that. You've, you've made some posts about certain things uh, that you've seen or things going on in your school or, or, or stores that are supporting certain agenda and you're saying, no, I'm not going to do that. And again, the rest of the world will look at you and they're going to say, what's your problem? Why? Uh, why, why are you doing that? And, and you're standing on some biblical convictions and some biblical principles to say, I'm not going to defile God. I'm not going to dishonor God. I'm going to stand strong for Him. I can tell you that for you as teenagers, uh, it, may be, it may be in the areas of your dress, the clothing that you wear, or it may be in the things that you're watching or you're viewing or how you're using your cell phones or your games or whatever, but you're going to say, uh, no, I'm going to take a stand to stand on biblical truths, biblical convictions, and not, not just let the culture tell me what I need to do. And so the passage that we've been using over these past weeks have been that passage that is found in the book of Proverbs, and, uh, and it's, the, it's the passage, I, I love this passage, it's kind of been a life verse for me for a long time, Proverbs 28.1. And that verse simply says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And today I want to share with you about another great example of a character out of the New Testament. All the ones previous to this have been guys and gals that we have found from the Old Testament. But I want to speak to you about uh, Stephen. And so if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of uh, Acts chapter 6. And uh, Jeremy has already alluded to this character and how bold and how strong he was and the things that he did and, and all of those things. So let's turn there, Acts chapter 6, and I'm just going to read verses um, um, 3 through 15, give us a picture and understanding of this, of this character, and then we'll discuss those other verses in chapter 7. Would you stand with me as I read to you from the Word of God? Standing as bold as a lion. And you'll, you'll be able to pick up very much on this. Notice what it says here in verse 3. It says, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will, devout, uh, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. And what they had said pleased the whole gathering. And they, the church, chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, 
and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte, a proselyte from Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. This is a picture of the first deacons that were, uh, that were called in that whole ministry of deacons. We have great men here in our church that's serving uh, in that capacity here. And notice what happened when the church chose these men to serve in that position. It says in verse 7, And the word of God continued to increase. God giving his favor is what we find here. And a number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the Jewish priests even became obedient to the faith. And then in verse 8, it gives to us, zeroes in on one of these seven characters. It says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Remember, some of these same groups of people were the ones who falsely accused Jesus. The same groups of people. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth was, will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Now notice what it says as they're looking at this man, Stephen, this deacon in the church. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face, the face of Stephen, was like the face of an angel. Let's pray together. Father, we ask for three things this morning. We ask, first of all, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see biblical truth. We need that. Every day we need that. We need to know what your word says. And then, Father, we're praying that you would work in us, that we would fulfill and be obedient to what we're reading. And so we're asking that. That not only would we hear your word, see it, read it, but that, Father, then we would act upon it and it becomes a part of our daily habit. A daily part that others would see you in us by our activities and our actions and the things we say and do and places we go. And then thirdly, Father, we pray for the spiritual needs of this congregation. There are those that are hurting. There are those that are unsaved. There are those that are searching, they're struggling. And even for those that are online viewing and listening this morning, church members that are not able to be here, some in sickness, some hurting, some struggling, and some in far off uh, away places. We just pray, Father, your Holy Spirit would meet their needs, whatever it might be, most importantly, spiritually, but then also, Father, the financial needs, the emotional needs, the physical needs. And Father, we ask these things for your glory and for your honor because you're worthy of it. You're a sovereign God. And you've asked us to bring our prayers, our petitions, our needs before you, to cast those cares upon you because you care for us. And so we're asking that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is a great passage of Scripture. I love preaching from the book of Acts. I enjoy very much what the Word of God has to say. Let me just ask you this. When is it easiest for believers to give a testimony of what God has been doing for him or her? Well, the obvious thing is most easy. So if, I, if I said to some of you here, uh, would, you, would you share a testimony? Different ones would stand up. It's easy to share a testimony among believers. It would be easy. Now, I know for some of you, say, you've got to be kidding. 
Pastor, yeah, I would I would faint, I would pass out if you called me to stand up and to testify. And I, I get that, I understand that. I, I've had people over the years that were very, very much, um, they, they, were, they were great leaders and good Christians, but when they just got in front of a crowd, they become nervous. But I can tell you, there are many that are in this room here that would stand up and they would say, I love the Lord, I, I love Him, and I, and I believe uh, what He's doing in my heart. I read His Word, and, and, I, and I give to mission causes, and I serve the Lord uh, every day. And I want to do that because of the great things He's done in my life, how He saved me. And you wouldn't have any problem whatsoever saying, you know how I love Jesus. And you may get all excited about it, maybe fall into an apostolic Pentecostal sin. I don't know. Uh, but but you, would, you certainly would become Baptocostical about it. Now, wait a minute. Let me just ask you this, though. What about when you're in a crowd of unbelievers? When you're at the mall? When you're in the workplace? And some of you work in some very difficult places. You've told me. You've shared with me. That the environment that you're in at your workplace is not a good place. The language is terrible. It's derogatory toward women. It's cruel, it's mean, it's hateful, it's nasty, it's dirty. What about when you're at the workplace? What about when you're at a ball game with your peers, with your friends? Or you're in an entertainment setting? When you're at school? When you're hanging out with your friends just cruising the strip or wherever it may be that you're cruising? How easy is it for you to talk about the Lord in those kind of places? When we talk about being bold and bold as a lion, I'm telling you, that's what it takes. I know that we have some of those within our congregation, no doubt, no question in my mind, whether they be junior high or high schoolers or college age or young adults or middle adults or senior adults that certainly will stand and say, no way, I'm not going to that. I love the Lord, I serve the Lord, and you're as bold as a lion. I know also, because I personally have been there through the years as I've grown over the years, how, how hard and difficult it has been for me when I first got saved to be in that work environment where 90 to 95 percent of those that were there uh, uh, used the foul language constantly and, uh, and were saying things and wanted you to listen to their crude, dirty, nasty jokes and uh, wanted to show you something. Uh, and I, I've, I've, I've had people like that around me and, and how difficult uh, it's been to, to speak out for the Lord. It's been, a, it, it's been as, I've, as, I've, as I've grown and I've learned and I've loved the Lord and I've seen how faithful He is uh, that He's been able to use me in those kind of environments. I believe we're headed for a time when, when more of us, if, all, if not all of us as believers, will be called upon to stand up for Jesus. We're living in that time, I'm telling you, that more and more of the things, the places that you buy, buy your stuff at, are coming out with, the, uh, with, with an agenda of supporting uh, an abomination of some sort, and there's so many different ones there, that they will ask you, uh, why in the world will you not support these kind of things? And if you said, I'm a Christian, then they're going to laugh at you and say, well, big deal, what does that matter? And for many, unfortunately, for many that attend church, it's not a big deal. But the Word of God says that there were those who were called upon by our Lord, and they stood up, and that they were not afraid. And so you may be the only Christian in your classroom or in your workplace. It may be that many of you here in this room uh, will be called upon in the near future, if not today, to call upon Christ as your Lord and to testify Him out in public about, your, about His saving grace or what He's done. And look for those opportunities to insert some biblical truth in the life of someone. My wife and I try to do that uh, often as we're in restaurants or we're in stores. We, we try to tune our ears to WGOD and be sensitive to His Holy Spirit that when He opens an opportunity, I can share a biblical truth with someone. There are things that I certainly shut the door on because I don't want to go there. 
and people may look at you and they may frown and they may, uh, they, they may even say some uh, very nasty, dirty things about you. But maybe for some of you, you'll, you'll go to work tomorrow and something negative will be said and, and uh, they may say, what did you do yesterday? Uh, we spent all day at the lake and that is great and we, we really, we were drinking and partying and I'm telling you, the whole weekend was just, uh, we just uh, drank our way uh, through, through the whole weekend. What did you do? Uh, well, I went to Sunday school. You did what? I went to church. Well, why would you do that? I came forward and laid hands on a group of youth getting ready to go to a student life week. You did what? We had a special offering and I gave you, you you're telling me, you gave money too? I mean, what did you get out of it? Oh, I got a whole bunch. Oh, God spoke to my heart in a great way. My wife and I feel blessed of God. Are you nuts? Surely, what did you do Sunday? I, I went back to church on Sunday. Are you kidding me? I'm telling you, most of the world is going to look at you that way. Most of the people right here in Sparta don't understand. Many churches don't understand why we take a stand and why this book has become such a valuable book to us. It's because we want to stand bold. Bold as a lion in biblical truths. And God wants us to. And you may have to do that sooner than you think. And so we see these kind of things. Let me just give you a little bit of a background here because uh, I, I find it interesting when you, when you study the name Stephen, uh, his name means crown. Now, there, there's two words in the Greek language that was used for crown. One of them is the word uh, uh, diadema. It, it's the word we get in English for diadem. And it was like a royal crown. It was a crown that a king would wear. Uh, or a princess, or someone of deity, uh, that may, maybe, uh, or somebody that was uh, of royalty, and they were given a crown. That's not the that's not the word that is used here for the name Stephen. The word for Stephen was a Greek word that was called Stephanus, and it was a word that meant the victor's crown, and it was a special crown. It was a crown that was earned by someone because of something that they did. Matter of fact, they had the Greek Olympics at that time, and the winner of whatever event it was would receive the victor's crown. Using the word, we get the word in English, Stephen from it. But the victor's crown, they would give them something. Sometimes it was a uh, it was a, a, a very uh, unique wreath that they would put around their neck. Today we use a, uh, uh, you know, a, they get a gold medal or a, or a silver medal or a bronze medal. But the victor's crown, that's what his name meant. It was powerful and, and he was known as, as, as someone who, who, was, uh, who, who was full of the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, you'll see what it, it says there and what they said pleased the whole gathering. And so they chose Stephen... And they, they kind of put, it's kind of like they put an emphasis on, on Stephen, this, this guy that, that his name represents a, a, a victorious crown. Uh, and, and, but, but he's also a guy that's filled full of the Holy Spirit. Now it mentions the others too, not that they weren't, but there's, there was something about Stephen. And by the way, let me just say that for every message, all six of the messages that I have spoken to you, on being bold as a lion, not one of those messages, not one person in them was a, was a preacher or a missionary or were they, were they someone who went to seminary, but every one of them was the ordinary Christian boy or girl that was raised and they learned the Word of God and they lived the ordinary Christian life in a super ordinary way. This is what we've got to see when it comes. See, I'm not giving to you pictures of people like who were the Apostle Paul. No doubt he, stand, he stood boldly. Or the Apostle Peter. I'm giving to you pictures of ordinary people just like you who were serving, sitting in a congregation or serving, doing what they had been called to do and they become very powerful in what they were doing. This is how God works. And Stephen was chosen 
as one of the original deacons in the church in Jerusalem, and serving tables was not a minimal task because every ministry in the church is an important ministry. There's no question about that. But it was a matter of priorities. The, the apostles uh, could not do all that needed to be done, and so these men were chosen, and, and we have deacons that are chosen, and there are jobs within the church that they should be doing, and they are doing, and we're working to let them do more. Why? Because they've been called for that. So we've got some Stevens right here within our own church. Now the question is, is how many Stevens do we have that's wearing the victor's crown, that's standing boldly to do what God would have us to do? D.L. Moody, the great evangelist from the Chicago area, said many years ago, it was better to put ten men to work than to try to do the work of ten men. That's why we have deacons. There are jobs and responsibilities within our church these men should be doing and need to be doing, and they will be doing. And then I want you to notice that it says that he was filled full of the Holy Spirit. This is a word that to describe something that belonged to Stephen uh, uh, in, in an abundant measure, something that characterized him as being under the control. It wasn't as though God came to him and, and put a spout over his head and started pouring it in. But, it was, but here was a man, Stephen, who was under the full control of the Holy Spirit. And he yielded himself to say, God, whatever you want of me, I'm willing to be used by you. So as a volunteer to be filled with the Holy Spirit is how God works. It's something, uh, it, it was something that um, uh, didn't, didn't come from the outside, but it had to do with something that was happening on the inside of Stephen's life. And so that's what happened here. And we see the evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in Stephen's life. In verse 3, it says uh, he had godly wisdom. In, in verse 8, it says he had, he had great faith. And, and then in verse 8 also it says that he had godly power. All of these things are important. They're areas that are very important. Now, here, here's what I have found over the years. And I like this quote from Oswald Chambers, a great man of God. He's an Englishman. He was an officer in the English military. He served in West Africa uh, and Northern Africa for many years. He's written the, my utmost for his highest tremendous writings. Uh, uh, just devotionals, but he said this, whether I hear God's call or not depends on the condition of my ears. I can tell you that right now. This is, this is some real good biblical truth right here. Whether I hear God's call or not depends on the condition of my ears. And exactly what I hear depends upon the condition of my heart. You see, God wants you to be as bold as a lion. And there are some that are cowering down. But as believers, all of us should be as bold as the lion. Let me give to you uh, something here that I think will help us in understanding those truths. First of all, every believer needs godly wisdom to speak out for Jesus. Notice in Acts chapter 6, verse 10, the words that the Bible describes this, this guy, Stephen. It says, but they could not withstand. Who are they? Uh, we're talking about all of the religious elite of their time. They could not withstand. That means that they could not contend. They could not even come close in a debate with this guy. And it says uh, that they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. You see, there was something different about him. How was Stephen able to do this? He's an uneducated guy in the sense that he didn't go to seminary to learn all of these things. Some of you are saying, I, I, I couldn't speak out for God. I, I can't do these kind of things. Uh, and that would be an impossibility. No, it's not. Uh, if you're a believer, just as uh, Jeremy stressed, most important, you have to know who you are. If you're a believer, something took place at the very moment that you gave your life to Christ. The Holy Spirit of God moved into your life. You could have been kneeling at an altar here. You could have been sitting in a pew back there. But at the very moment that you gave your life to Christ, something happened, and that was that the Spirit of God moved into your life. 
And Stephen was able to share and to say what he did because the Holy Spirit of God was in him, the same Holy Spirit that's in you. You know what one of the biggest problems of, with pastors and preachers and missionaries uh, over the years have been? Not releasing church people, believers, to do the work God's called them to do. Could you imagine if the apostles had said, now hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on here just a minute, Stephen. You're getting a little, you're, you're getting a little bit carried away here. You, you know, you're not a preacher. You, you shouldn't be leading this Bible study. You, you, you know, you know, Stephen, Stephen, you, you, you shouldn't be doing, people are starting to say that you have, well, you have the wisdom of God. And you need to back away just a little bit. And you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be trying to debate these religious scholars. You leave that up to us. We've been trained for that. They didn't do that at all. You know why? Because they believe in what's called discipleship and discipling. And that means they, that, that Stephen became a student of the Lord Jesus. And as a student of the Lord Jesus, he grew. And the apostles released him to do the work of the ministry. You see, it's not what's going on here at this church building on Sunday. That's the most important, significant thing of the week. You know what it is? You being out in the workplace. You being out in the marketplace. You going out. This is the filling station. Mm -hmm. This is where you come to be taught, okay? It, really, even in the, in the early church, it wasn't the evangelism station. It was the training center. So you would go out and do the work of the ministry of evangelizing an unsafe world. And Stephen was doing just that. He called it. He understood it. And he was remarkable. He, he, you know, he was one of the first mentioned soul-winning deacons here. Now, he wasn't the only one because Philip also being mentioned here. We find him a little bit later as a second soul-winning deacon. And so the responsibility of the deacons were to be soul-winners. That's part of every Christian's job, their responsibility. And so Acts 6 and 7, uh, we find out some tremendous truths about what was taking place. And, 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 and every believer needs godly wisdom, comes from the Holy Spirit of God, to speak out the biblical truth that God would have for us. And so I know that there's times that, oh, I'm, 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 I'm afraid, I don't, I don't know that I could do that. I don't, I don't know that I'm able to do those kind of things, but there was something unique about what was happening in Stephen's life. Let me give you a Bible promise. Luke chapter 21, verse 12. You can write this down the margin of your Bible, right here beside this. You can write that down. And, uh, and, and this verse says, But before all of this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, and delivering you up to the synagogues and the prisons, and you'll be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. Because you're a believer. Now notice what he says. This is a Bible promise he gives to us. This will be your opportunity. Listen, Mr. Spiritual guy, spiritual gal, spiritual teenager. This is your opportunity, a setup that God has said so that you would be sharing out into a lost world. And he's given to us a Bible promise that this is your opportunity to bear witness. And then notice what he says in verse 14. He says, settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Isn't that exactly what the Bible is saying here that Stephen was able to do? Absolutely. There should be an amen right there. Okay. Stay with me. Here's the second thing. Not only, not only do we need to speak out for Jesus... But notice in this passage of Scripture in verse 8, every believer needs godly power to stand up. Not just speak out, but to stand up for Jesus. And notice what it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Well, he wasn't even a preacher. What was he doing this for? Well, because I just want to, I want you to know that again, when the Holy Spirit of God, he doesn't say, let's see, Preacher, missionary, deacon. No, no, we're going to wait on you a little bit. 
He doesn't. No. The same Holy Spirit. I found this out. You know, one, one of my biggest problems was on the mission field was that when some, some of our tribal people trusted Christ, I did not trust them with the Holy Spirit that was living in me. I don't think they can do that. I don't think they're ready for that. And I doubt it. If I had to do it all over again, very early on, I would be turning more over to them very early on as believers in helping them. And you know what? They will make mistakes because you made mistakes and I've made mistakes. And oh, I go back and look at some of the, I have some of the first outlines that I ever preached 43 years ago. I am embarrassed. I read them and I want to send a letter back to that church. I am so sorry that you had to listen to this. I'm glad it was not recorded. Only in heaven. And you know what, God, when he heard, when he heard me preaching, then you know what he did? Uh, he said, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because he looked at me from the perspective of where I was spiritually. Now listen, after 43 years, if I still preaching that, he would say, ah, uh, you know what? Big problem here. About 20 some years ago, you kind of said, well, I've got this one down, and I no longer need. No, no. See, the thing is, it was the Holy Spirit of God that was at work, and, and, it, and, and Stephen was full not only of wisdom, but he was, he was full of grace and power in doing wonderful things, and the people noticed it. They saw it. They could tell the difference. Now, let me give you another promise, because there's a great promise here that, that I believe that, that, that can help you. Uh, and and I, w- I want you to see, first of all, in Acts chapter 7, this isn't the promise, it's coming next. But I want you to see the message of where he stood up boldly and he preached the message. He said this, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did, uh, did your fathers not persecute? And they kill those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, speaking of our Lord Jesus, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. He was pretty bold. He stood up in the midst of them, didn't cower down. This guy that wasn't a pastor, wasn't a preacher, wasn't a seminary graduate, the church member that loved Jesus, serving in the church, his main job was setting up and getting food distribution and, and serving and meeting the needs of the people in the church. But he stood up with biblical conviction and truth and said, hold it, Jim. hold it, hold it, hold it. Let me just tell you what I believe. Now let me give you a promise here. And that promise is found in Matthew 10 and in verse 28. Notice what this promise, you can write this on the margin right here beside these verses. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, now I, I, I just want to tell you this, and again, I just tell you I, I love you. I care very much about where you are spiritually. I care very much about our junior high and high schoolers and college age. Be careful not to get so sucked into the culture that we act like the culture of an unsaved group of people, and we dress like an unsaved, because I'm telling you, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's not getting better. And I know what some of you are thinking. But pastor, there's just not anywhere where we can go to buy the kind of clothing that we need. And if we did, we would be so out of touch. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Who are you trying to please? Only you can make that decision. Guys, only you can make that decision. Girls, only you can make that decision as to how you'll dress. About what you're... But, 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 but everybody, everybody else, well... Broad is the road that leads to destruction, Jesus said. Narrow is the gate that we must go in. Straight 
and few there be that find it. Have you found it? It will require some conviction on your part. See, you can't just say, I'm a believer and live in a contrary way. By saying that, what you there's something wrong with that picture. And so, so again, let me just tell you, I love you, I care, care for you, I care enough for you that I will say something about it. And I, re- I, I believe that moms and dads, you are a key, and I know how hard that is. It's not an easy thing. Because you don't want to hurt your kids, but you've got to be a parent. I shared with you how that my wife gave our oldest granddaughter her first spanking from, from Grandma, the first one. She had had them before, I'm sure. And it was all about this. Grandma and her were walking out to the mailbox. The mailbox box was on the other side of the room. And she did not have Grandma's hand. And Grandma said, let's go out and get the mail. And Casey June takes off running. And she runs across the road. Grandma's saying, stop, stop, stop. Casey June didn't stop. She ran all the way across, and then she waited for Grandma on the other side. Praise the Lord, there were no cars coming. It wasn't that way for Arnold Farthing, a guy that I grew up with and a businessman in the Odin area. His daughter, about the same age, was on a little bicycle. And he was on a bicycle with her on a country road. And they were going to cross the highway. And she darted out in front of him and he's saying, Stop! Stop! And the car hit her. And she died. I remember as a high schooler going to the funeral for that little girl. Grandma Karen spanked Casey June. Now, I'm going to tell you, that was hard for her to do. Why did she do that? I don't want her hurt. I have to teach her the right things. Stephen was standing boldly. He was standing up when no one else would stand up. He wasn't afraid of what others might say. He wanted one thing, that his Lord would be pleased. Listen, 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 parents. If you want your girls, when they're older, to wear the appropriate kind of clothes, don't dress them when they're younger with inappropriate clothes, thinking, oh, it's cute, it's all right. You must start when they're younger. You can teach them. Now, here's what I wish. Some of you are great. You're great seamstresses. Start making clothes, Christian clothes. It's possible. It's doable. And I think you would be surprised how it may take off and how, how good that may be. You girls, be careful. Let me just say this, okay? It's not in my notes, but I'm going to say it. You teenage girls that are dating, if all, listen, you may not be interested in what these guys are interested in. But I'm going to tell you that their whole view of things changes by the way you're dressed. I can tell you that 100%. How you dress will affect what these guys are thinking. If you're, in, it, listen, if dating is about trying to attract, I've got to dress a certain way in order to attract this guy uh, to me, then I'm telling you, you're in trouble. 
You're in trouble from the get-go. Don't do that, girls. I'm going to tell you, God, what was we're talking about, the very God that uh, spoke our world into existence, this great God, when He's the Lord of your life, He will give to you somebody uh, that is worth having in life that can be a great husband, a great leader, and you can be champions living for Jesus. Stand bold. Don't be afraid. Stand bold. Make a determination. uh, It doesn't matter what everybody else is saying, what they're doing, how they're doing it, and and how they're dressing. You do what's right. Okay, let me move on. I know I've been meddling. Let's go to the third thing, and this will be the last, and that's this. Every believer needs godly faith to suffer for Jesus. Suffer? I mean, we... The Bible says here in, in, verse, in verse 5, Stephen was a man full of faith. You wonder what kind of world we live in when good and godly people like Stephen can be murdered by religious bigots? But we, we have a similar problems in our enlightened world today. Hostages are being taken bombings and killings and maiming of innocent people and shooting and assassinations and all of it done in the name of politics and religion. It's going on everywhere. I just read this week, two teenage boys and a pastor abducted in Nigeria. I just read this week, Christian girls were taken in Pakistan to become sex, sex trade, in the sex trade, by Muslims. Our world is, is a crazy world. It's a dangerous world. We can't imagine some of what's happening. We're, we're, we, we can be thankful at this point, at this time, but I'm telling you, it's, it's crowding in and, it, and it's getting closer to home. And, and we're seeing more and more of the anti-Christian things that are being said and done to the point uh, where, where your, question, your faith will be questioned on every opportunity. And you will lose job promotions and you will lose this and you will lose that and you will lose other things because you're a Christian. And so for some reason we think that if we're, if we're full of faith and we're not going to suffer or have problems, that our faith is going to get us out of all kinds of difficulties. But friends, listen to me. Faith does not get you out of difficulties. It may get you into difficulties. And so some would say, well, I have faith and I don't, I don't want to have faith. I don't want to have it. It get into more problems because you love the Lord and you know the eternal eternal rewards of that, spending eternity with Jesus. Jesus didn't come to get you out of trouble. He came to give you faith to stand in the midst of your troubles. Faith will will not keep you from suffering. If that were the case, I never would have gone to to New Guinea to to serve as a missionary. I I, I wouldn't have gone there. I I, I didn't want to see my uh, my children with malaria or with typhoid fever or my wife with malaria or myself or or some of the other issues. that I wouldn't have done that. But faith enabled us to go through all the suffering to say, to you be the glory, to you be the honor. A man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. That's what Stephen was. That's what Stephen was doing. He was filled. Something had taken control of him. And he spoke out. And so in verses 54, I want you to, to notice what this, this man of faith, or what he experienced and what he did. It says, now when they heard these things, they, they were enraged. He preached a message. One of the greatest. Now here again, uh, he preached a message. Earlier we find Peter's message. And there were 3,000 people that come to know Christ on that day. Stephen preaches a message, and he got 3,000 stones, not souls, stones. It wasn't Peter. He was a layman. Stephen, just like you. And he knew his Bible. We have the greatest recorded 
New Testament historical accounts of the Old Testament because of this deacon. He was a deacon that knew the Word. He studied the Word. He read the Word. He lived it out. You can too as a layman. You read the Word you study. If you take this book and, and you be like a sponge and you soak up everything you can, uh, you read it every day, you listen to messages, you listen to them uh, on, the, on the radio, you spend time before you, uh, before you start your day, you spend time after uh, your day is ended in just looking to the Word of God and saying, Oh God, uh, I want to be a sponge and soak up all that I can in knowing you. You can do that. You'll be a champion for Jesus. Some of you have that kind of a heart and a passion. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And, and they ground their teeth at him. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city. And notice what it says. And stoned him. In verse 55, notice what it says. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Just a couple more verses. And as they were standing, or as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, meaning he died. See, the great question is not, do you have great faith to escape? But the great question is, do you have great faith to endure suffering? Some people are suffering, they're hurting. Our brothers and sisters around the world but there's some here within our own communities that physically are suffering. The great question is not, do you have faith to be delivered, but do you have faith to die, if that should be the case? The great question is not, do, do you have enough faith to be healed so you can praise God, but do you have enough faith to be healed and yet uh, and not be healed, but, but yet praise God? I wish that all that had cancer, we could lay hands on them and they would, they would be healed. But it doesn't happen that way, does it? If you're expecting the Christian life to be a pleasure trip, you're in for something quite different. Someone's given you, uh, and they're guilty of uh, false advertising. It's challenging. And it's not a gloom and doom message, it's a message of hope. I can, I can tell you that the Bible, the Bible tells us a great passage of Scripture that we find here. And, uh, and, and it's so good uh, when, we, when we read it. We're, I'm reminded of what the book of Revelation tells us and how that, uh, that God gives to us His Word and takes care of us in the midst of those kind of things, the reward that you will have. He says that you will have the victor's crown. Let me tell you something else that happened out of this. There was a young man that was there at the stoning of Stephen. And he was saying, I'll hold your coat. I'll, I'll hold your coat. I'll, I'll hold your coat. I'll hold your coat. Maybe he was too young. Maybe he wasn't a good rock thrower. We don't know, but he was holding the coats of all those that was around. And this young guy's name was Saul. Later on, Saul became the Apostle Paul. I believe oftentimes when Saul would refer to himself as the chief of sinners and feeling so guilty, he remembered, he remembered those times of holding the coats of those that had killed one of the first deacons in the church there. You notice that when Stephen died, he did something. When Stephen died, he, the, some, the last words he said was, Lord, do not hold this to them. Do not charge them. Forgive them. 
I wonder where Stephen heard those words. Perhaps since he was from Jerusalem, maybe it was that when Jesus died on the cross that Stephen was a young boy, a young lad looking up and he seen this man on the cross who is, whose blood was shed and his life was being given and, and Stephen heard this man say, Lord, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. And so Stephen, at a young age, gave his life to Christ. He studied the Scriptures the best that he could. He knew and was used by God. And the time came for him to die. And his thoughts was just the same as what he saw and remembered as Jesus, his Lord, had died on a cross. Now this morning for us, where does that leave us? What about you and where you are? Some of you are going through some difficult times, challenging times, no doubt. Well, let me just uh, let me just back that up because before before that, what you need to be looking at is: Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you given your life to Christ? You'll never be able to be bold as a lion. You'll never be able to stand strong uh, dealing with the issues and the things that uh, are thrown before us on a daily basis unless we have Christ living in us. He gives to us the godly wisdom like what Stephen has. He gives to us the faith we need. He gives to us the working of His Holy Spirit uh, to, to do what we need to do on a daily basis. It's only going to be through Christ and through what He can do. And so that's where it always starts. And some in this room, perhaps you've never prayed and trusted Christ as your Lord. Would you do that today? Would you give your life to Christ today? And so let's stand together. We'll ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that over this crowd of people that fear your Holy Spirit has spoken to them and helped them to bring them to a place where they need to be, where each of us here are standing before you. We love you because of who you are, what you've done on the cross of Calvary. You've given your life, and because you've given your life to us, we want to live for you. We want to be as bold uh, as a lion. We want to stand for the righteous things. And so we're praying for a moving of your Spirit in our hearts, even as adults, as teenagers, as junior high, as children, as young adults, that, Father, we would be living a life holy for you. Convict us and move us to where we need to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you come as God has spoken to your heart this morning? You step out, you come as Julie leads us.